get them yesterday, they will be online. Tax credits, tax avoidance, and tax evasion, and the differences between those. Any questions on that? We've gotten, we started this example. We filled out the top half of the 1040. Okay. And then we filled out the Schedule B. Any questions on these pages at all? The Schedule B that we did or the 1040? We filled out the Schedule B, but we haven't transferred the money over yet. Okay. The top part of our Schedule B was interest. And we have a total of sixteen eighty nine. Okay, so everything, um, all the interest together gave us sixteen eighty nine. This goes on taxable interest sixteen eighty nine. And again, we had to fill out, fill out the Schedule B for two reasons: one, because there were two different banks, and for the second reason was that we were over fifteen hundred. Okay, so um, we might write that on our note here. So if you have over 1,500 or more than one source is when you, you have to fill out the Schedule B for your interest. Okay. Then we also had two sources of stock. So that's why we filled out this part for the stock. And for the stock, it's a similar... Thing. It's not the um, over 1500 part though anymore. It's just more than one source. Actually, we have over, yeah, it is also over 1500. It's glittery thing. Okay, oh, it's all, it doesn't show up very well. Okay, so here. If we were over 1,500 is when we had to complete this bottom part, which is just about whether or not your stocks are from foreign, foreign entities. Okay. Um, if they were from a foreign trust, there's a form you have to fill out. Okay, so, and then if you, were, if you answer yes to this, you have another form to fill out. So basically, if you answer yes to either of these, there's another form to fill out. There's always another form to fill out. Okay, so we take our total from our tax, which was 1644, and we put that on our ordinary dividend line. Now this paper, our Schedule B is done. We can't throw it away, though. It has to be attached, so it just goes on the bottom. Okay. All right, so we've got our income, our interest, and our stock dividend. Okay, we don't have any taxable refunds or credits. We do have, let's see, if we look on here, she did win 300 in the lottery. Lottery winnings are taxable because they are considered income. If you look down here, 
where it says other income, that's where you would put that. So lottery is 300. Now, as you can see on this 1040, there's more different options than there were on the 1040A. You have all of the capital gain and, and um, losses and the IRA and pension like we had with the 40A. But you have business income, Schedule C or CEZ. This is if you own your own business. That's when you fill that out. So if you have income from a business, there's another form to fill out. Um, if you receive alimony, that's... Now, child support is not considered to be income. You don't have to put child support on here. But alimony is. You guys know what alimony is? If you get divorced and your spouse has to give you money, yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, if you have rental real estate, so you have properties that you rent out, if you have royalties, remember royalties are like commission, but they're based off of artistic endeavors, so books, art, movies, things like that, if you have royalties. If you have a partnership or an S corporation, these are types of businesses, or you're getting money from a trust, then you put that here and you have another form to fill out. And then there's a farm income or loss. Remember I said there's like a form for if you work on a farm. There you go. If you have a farm and you made income, that's another. But this one's at least form F. F for farm. If you got Social Security benefits, and then other income, it's income that's not listed here, so lottery or trying to think. Um, maybe something from a 1099 could go there. Then we add all of this up, and that's our total income. Okay, so our total income becomes 79854. Okay. So that is our total income. Now we go back to our example scenario, and we have that Margaret teaches a night course and had 133 in educator expenses. Yeah, I'll pull it back up in a second. I just want to go through this first. Educator expenses and they had moving expenses. These can get deducted on your 1040A or 1040, sorry. So I'm going to slide this up just a little bit and we get into the adjustment section. These are things that get subtracted from your income. Okay. Educator expenses. Remember, it's up to 200. Well, she had 133, so we can put those in there. Okay, certain business expenses. And then you have another form. Um, like performing artists can deduct, you know, hair, makeup, clothing, because they're performance art, so, you know, costumes and things like that. Um, certain business expenses of reservists. The basis government officials. So the, that's certain business expenses that can be deducted here. Um, health savings account deduction. This is if you're putting money into a health savings account, but that is not taken out of your paycheck. Okay, so if you have one of those flexible spending accounts that come out of your paycheck, you can't put that money here because it's already not been taxed. But if you open a different health savings account you can that you put money in yourself, then you can deduct it. Um, moving expenses, they had the 3009 Okay. Deductible part of self-employment tax. Okay, you get charged self-employment tax, but some of it's deductible. Then you have plans, self-employed health insurance deduction. If you're self-employed and you're paying out of pocket for health insurance, you can. There's a deduction allowed. Um, if you were charged a penalty on early withdrawal of savings, you can deduct that. If you pay alimony. You can deduct that. And the reason you can deduct that is because the person you pay alimony to has to claim it as income, so they're going to get taxed for it. 
That's pretty much the only perk, yeah. Um, but you have to have their social security number. Well, you figure if you were married, if you were married to them, you probably already had it. If you're getting divorced and you know you're going to have to pay alimony, you get this. Yeah, you'll have this. Okay. Um, IRA deduction. So if you're putting money into an uh, IRA account, which is a retirement account, remember I said those don't get taxed until you use them. So if if it comes out of your paycheck pre-tax, you can't put it here. But if you have your own account outside of your paycheck, you know, that you put money into, then you can put it here. Um, student loan interest. If you're paying interest on your student loans, that goes here. Where it's um, it's once you start paying back your loans is when you start paying back your paying your interest off, and then your once that happens, once you start paying your loans, your lender will send you a 10, 1098, I believe is ten ninety eight that says how much of it was interest that you paid, and then you can deduct the interest. You can't deduct the payment. payment, but you can deduct the interest. Right. And then you have tuition and fees, again, a form. Okay, domestic production activities deduction. That is if you are producing things for your business domestically. And then you add all this up. So we've got 12, carry me one, that's four, one, three. Okay. We added that, oh, sorry, I put that in the wrong line. Put that there. Add them up, so I added them, it goes here. Then that gets subtracted from your original pay. So we were at 7,900, sorry, 79,854. We subtract 3,142, and we are now at 76712. Okay, so any questions on the adjustments? Again, it's kind of explanatory. You just go through the list and say, oh, did I have that? Oh, why, yes, I did. And then you put the money down. Oh, I put that in the wrong line. Make sure you put it on the right line, though. Don't do what I just did. But, you know, you, you read it, and if you had it, then you put something on there. If you didn't have it, you leave it blank. At the back of the form, hold on, I just somehow wrote a line across the picture that's doing the recording. I'm not really sure how to do that. At the back of the form, we're going to write the payback down that from the front. Okay. None of you guys are blind or born before 58, 48, so you don't have to. But if you did, you just check them off and count them. If your I spouse itemizes on a separate term, return check there. Okay, itemized deductions. We are not going to have itemized. Yes, we are. Oh, yes, we are. We're doing itemizations. Okay, so grab a Schedule A. Schedule A looks like this. Okay, so... What we're going to be doing is we're going to be making a comparison. They are married filing jointly. Their standard deduction is 11,900. We're going to do the itemizations to determine if their itemized deductions are greater than the 11,900 or not. So we take our schedule A and we look at the Next part of the question, which says they had 18,800 in medical expenses. Now insurance paid 80%, they paid 20%. Okay, so what happens is you can't claim the whole amount. You can only claim what you paid. So we have to take that 18,800 and we multiply it by 0.2 for the 20% that they paid. And it's 3,760. Okay, so that's how much they paid out of pocket. 
that's how much we can put on this form. Now, most insurance companies, but check, because if you're going to claim medical, you need to have all the receipts. But most insurance companies can give you an annual summary of how much your medical expenses were and how much you paid out of pocket, and it's itemized, and you can use that if it came from your insurance company for your taxes, but don't rely on that unless you absolutely know for a fact your insurance companies do provide it. Save your receipts until you find out one way or the other kind of thing. Because anything that you put on here that you're deduce, deducting, and actually anything you put on here that you're deducting, even on the front, you have to have proof. For example, educator expenses. Sure, I could say, yeah, I spent $200 in the classroom this year, but I have to have my receipts to prove that I spent $200 on classroom supplies. And I mean, that can be anything I'd use in the classroom. It can be you know, Kleenex for you guys and hand sanitizer. But it has to be something that would, uh, would be used in the class. It's not shoes. You know what I mean? It's, it has to be something that would be classroom use. So you, you have to make sure you have the receipts. That's really important. Okay, so they're able to claim 3760 Okay. Now, the amount from 1040 line 38 has to go right here. Okay, so we look at our 1040 line 38. And then write that in 76712. And here's why. You are allowed on medical expenses to claim anything that's over 7.5% of your salary. They expect you to pay for 7.5% of your salary without any reimbursement, but anything over that you can deduct. So you take this amount and you multiply it by 0 0.075. If line 3 is smaller than line 1, you can claim a deduction. But see, this is how much they have to spend out of pocket before they can claim anything. They only got 3700 not 57 They have no medical expense deduction that they can claim. Does that make sense? You had to spend more than this. So they can't claim medical. But if we go back to the example problem, they have state income tax, real estate tax, and mortgage interest. That is the next section. You have state and local, real estate, personal property tax, other taxes, home mortgage interest, etc. Now, the state and local tax. Okay. Living in Florida, you'll never have this one. State income, well, I guess never say never. I guess they could vote one in, yeah. They, oh, you, I don't know that any governor is willing to risk it. You get lynched. Just kidding. Um, but currently, we don't have a state income tax. You can claim your sales tax. No, your sales tax. Like on your receipt, you know, when you buy anything, every time you buy something, you're paying sales tax? Well, it has to make it so that your itemization, it has to be worth it. Like, if your sales tax for the whole year is like $70, you could put it on here, but then you want to make sure the total at the end is over 11000 if you're filing jointly. So... If you're single, it has to be above 5,000, but you're head of household, so it would, you'd have to be having deductions of more than 8,700. Right, and does that include the medical? And then it, it's going to include everything we talk about on this paper. Right, so at the end, all those deductions have to be above 8,700. 8,700, yeah. To, to make it worth itemizing. Right. 
So, you know, you have, it, it kind of just depends. Do you, is it willing, to, are you willing to save all the receipts all year? I would save the receipts. Okay. No, you, sales, you can't claim the items, but you can only claim the sales tax. Yeah, right. Okay, so just, just, just the tax. Just the tax. No, just the tax, which is why I said so it may not be worth it to, to go through all the trouble of saving all that up because you're talking about a dollar here, two dollars there. You know, it's not, unless you're buying bigger expensive items, then it might be worth it, yeah. Yeah, so it's just it's a it's a matter of opinion right. as to whether you feel it's personally worth it to save all of that, right. add it all up, and put it on here. Right. But if you have a state income tax, of course, put it on here because that's already added for you. It's on your W two. Okay. Well, they had a state income tax of thirty two ninety eight. Now you can only claim one or the other. Okay. You cannot claim both state income tax and sales tax. So you can only do one or the other. Now, in Florida, we don't have a state income tax, so your really only option is sales tax. But say Georgia has a state income tax. So you would have to look at which dollar amount is higher. You, want, well, you pick whichever is higher. Wait, so what's the state income tax? It's like federal income tax, except it goes to the state. It comes off of your paycheck. Okay. So you get federal income out as well? No. Oh, wait, of your check? Out yeah. Yes, you get both. Yeah. You can actually have three levels of income tax, state, federal, federal state, and local. Counties can charge income tax, too. Okay. Um, they had 3,567 in real estate taxes. Now, there's a difference between real estate tax and personal property tax. Okay, and the reason I call this, this is property tax. for real estate, like land, buildings. Personal property taxes are for personal property. If you're paying tax on your car, your camper van, your boat, things like that. Those are considered to be personal property. A mobile home is personal property. Uh-huh. That's your personal property tax. Right. So technically, you can put your. All the things contribute to your personal property. Yeah. No, just the taxes. Just the taxes. Yeah. So when you pay for your tags, it there, whatever, like the sixty dollars or whatever it is. There's different parts that add up to that sixty dollars. You can only put the tax. Right. Not the sixty dollars, but the things the tax. Does. Not the whole thing, but yeah. So that can go there. You have to put an amount. Right, right, right. Like, does that happen? No, it just has to be, right. yeah. Right. But you have to have, again, proof, so you have to keep the receipt. Right, okay. Okay. Um, other taxes, any other kind of taxes that are local or state level that you've paid can go here. Now, there's not a whole lot of other kind of taxes, but there's a list of what kinds are acceptable in the book like in the instructions so before you go listing all of them you know, just check to see if it's something you can't actually claim then you add these together now the nice thing about the taxes is unlike the medical we don't have to do that percentage thing you can claim the whole thing so that goes right there so you get to claim all of the taxes. Okay, um, you can also claim your mortgage interest. Now, not your mortgage interest that you know you're going to pay for the whole house, just the mortgage interest you paid that year, right. which will get, you can either get it reported to you or not reported to you. Um, like if, for example, owner financing. Have you guys heard of owner financing? Like somebody might hold the mortgage and charge you interest like finance it personally like if I own a house and you're down you know I might hold the financing for you and you make payments to me every month until it's paid off well I'd charge you interest but I'm not going to report it on the form 1098 to you 
you're still paying interest and you can still claim that interest. You just have to have the information, which obviously if you were paying for house from me, you'd have my information, right? I mean, that makes sense. You're sending me a check every month. Right. You put their information here. And that's just so the IRS can go verify it if they need to. Like they might, like if it's my house that I'm selling it to, they might call me up and ask me to verify that yes, indeed, you did pay this interest. Otherwise, if it's like a bank or a lending institution, you should get a 1098. Now, sometimes things fall through the cracks and you don't get one. So even if it's a bank or lending institution, you can put that here. Um, on our example, they paid $3,096 in mortgage interest. Um, then there's something called points. And points are fees paid on mortgages, and we'll go into that kind of later, but you get them reported or not, and those go here. Mortgage insurance, okay, this is not the same as homeowner's insurance. Homeowner's insurance is insurance that you have to protect your house and your belongings. Mortgage insurance is insurance you pay should something happen to you and you're unable to pay your mortgage, this will pay your mortgage. Okay, so they're two different things. This is for the actual loan. You cannot claim homeowner's insurance, but you can claim mortgage insurance. The protecting, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, if you had to pay interest on an investment, this is not earned, this is not, this is paid, not earned. Okay. Then um, you attach this form here, and then you add those lines, and that goes here. Again, you don't have to do the percentage on interest. The next section we have is charity. Charity. We have $987 to different charities. The highest amount they gave to any single one was 100 That is important, and I'll show you why in a second. We have $450 worth of old clothes. The highest they gave to anyone was $120. Okay. Here's why that's important. If you make charitable donation to a single entity of $250 or more, you have to do a different thing. It says see instructions. There's this whole other thing that you have to do. If you keep your donations to each individual entity under 250, then you can just put it on here. So that's why it said it's important that the amount they gave to us any single one was 100. The highest is 100. So you have $987. So this is cash or check. And then down here you have other than cash or check. So other than cash or check, do you know how they have those donate your car? Or if you donate clothes to Goodwill. If you put it in the box on the side of the road, you can't claim it. Because you have to have a receipt. Like a donation receipt. But if you take it into the Goodwill and you give them a bag of clothes, they'll say, how much were these clothes worth? And you can say the amount that you said they're worth. Like how much you paid for them or whatever. And then they'll give you a receipt. Now, you can't be ridiculous. You can't take in like a grocery bag and be like, it's a thousand dollars of clothes right here. You know, it's, it can, it, but it's, you could say 50 or a hundred dollars is worth of clothes in this bag, you know, like however, be realistic. But any kind of donation like that where it's items goes on this line. Again, though, you have to have receipts for these things. You can't just say, oh, I gave. Yeah, yeah. like I stuck a $100 bill in the Salvation Army Santa guy outside in his little change bucket. Okay, good for you. Prove it. You know what I mean? You have to be able to prove it. So you have to have the receipts. Nope, you have to have a receipt. You have to have a receipt. And then carry over from the prior year. This is the only area gifts to charity where you can bring in information from last year for a deduction.
So for example, if I itemized, if I didn't itemize last year, but I had receipts for charitable donations, but I didn't have enough to itemize, but this year I do have enough to itemize, I can bring in those receipts from last year and use them this year. Yes. Schedule A. So this is the only category where you can do that. And it's only good for one year. So I can bring in things I donated last year, uh, 2013, but I cannot bring in anything from 2012. Okay? So that's kind of good to know. So like if you have charitable notion donations one year and you don't have enough to itemize, save those receipts for one more year. and do both years at the same time yeah a little more. yeah but I'm just saying like so that but this is the only area where you can do that but if you do have those like I said if you don't have enough to itemize this year maybe you will itemize next year so keep them just in case and then after the year then throw them away if you don't use them kind of thing these get added together and it goes there again no percentage on this one. Okay, Casualty and theft losses. There's another form you do have to attach for this where you fill out the information about the theft or the casualty. Now casualty, fire, flood, hail, tornado, hurricane, casualty, car accident, okay, accidents, nature, Theft, of course, is, hey, some jerk came and stole all my stuff out of my house. Now, not covered by insurance is the kind of the key to this. If you have insurance and your insurance covers it and you get all your money back, you can't claim these. But let's say, okay, let's say your home is insured and all the items in your home are insured and your house burns down. Just hypothetically, let's just say that. No. And let's just say, hypothetically speaking, your insurance covered to pay off your house, but didn't cover the value of all of your items. Let's say it was like, I don't know, $25,000 short. That could go here. Okay. So if your insurance doesn't cover everything, that's where this goes. Or if you don't have insurance, like theft insurance, if you have homeowner's insurance, you're covered for theft. But if you're renting and you don't have renter's insurance, you're not covered for theft. Right. Or, you know, if you're out in the sh at the airport and somebody steals your suitcase of all your stuff, they don't have airport insurance, theft insurance, you know, I mean, like, it's, they don't have that. So that's where this kind of inf things happen. Again, you have a form to fill out, and you would have to have proof. You can't just be like, somebody stole my Maserati. Yeah, no, really, I had one. Oh, it wasn't registered. No, like, you have to have proof. Okay. So in our example here, we had $9,230 worth of flood damage that was not covered. Well, probably what happened is the flood damage was way higher than this. Right. And that's what was left. That's the other thing. If, it's, if your insurance covers like 90% of it, but you have 10% of it left, you claim that 10%. Right. Because that came out of your income. Yes. So that goes here. Okay. Then we get into job expenses and certain miscellaneous deductions. Now... Um, interesting things about what you can and cannot deduct for your job. Okay. Mileage on your car. You cannot deduct your commute to work in the morning and home from work at night. You cannot deduct those miles. However, if you have to drive for your job, like during the day you have to drive around, or if you have to go like on a business trip but it's drivable so you don't fly, you can claim that mileage. So you just, you can't claim your daily commute to and from work, but you can claim any other driving you do for work. 
okay? If you claim mileage, you cannot claim tolls. You have to choose one or the other. Whichever one is more money, obviously. But you can only choose mileage or you can choose tolls. Um, if you're choosing tolls, well, oh, sorry, it's mileage or tolls and gas. One or the other, not both. Okay. Um, union dues can be claimed. Job education can be claimed if you have to take the class as a condition of your employment, but they don't pay for it. So like it's a required thing that you have to do for your job, but then they don't pay for the class or books or whatever that you need. And then like I said, there's always a form. There's a form. Um, other things that cannot be well if, if anything's unreimbursed that you had to pay for for work like if you had not if you had to make copies of your resume obviously but if you had to go make copies at the Kinko's for your for your job and they didn't pay for them you could claim things like that okay um, so if we look Right here, I even put it on here. This is not driving to work because that's not tax deductible. Going to and from work is not tax deductible. It's just driving around for work is. So we had $541 in expenses for job travel. Um, $1,439 in union dues. And two college classes related to employment. Now there's a difference between tuition and fees that you're just taking to work on your degree and then classes for your job. They go in two different places. So we put those on here. We have unreimbursed employees th expenses. That's the 541 plus the union dues. Sorry. So we have add those together. Do I need to carry a one there? No. Carry in ones where there are no ones. Sorry. 1980 goes here. Um, tax prep fees, we don't have any of that. But if you do pay somebody's, like, so let's say this year you go to H&R Block and you have them do your taxes, okay, on your 2013 taxes. Save the receipt. And next year, you can claim it on your 2014 taxes. Okay, other expenses, investments, or safe deposit box, etc. go here. We add those lines up. Oh, I forgot to put the education in there. Darn it. Hold on. Okay, yeah, so I forgot to put the... Okay, so we've got 541 for the job travel, 1439 for union dues, and 2315 for um, tuition. Sorry about that. If anybody needs to use my whiteout, you can. Okay, they didn't have any tax prep. They didn't have any of these other fees. We add that up. We get 4295. Again, the amount from line 38 on 1040. That was their adjusted income. And we have to multiply it by 2%. Because this is only covered for anything over 2% of your salary. So I take 76712 times 2%. And that gives me 153424. This is larger than this, so I do have a deduction. So I subtract the 1534. 24 from the 4295 and I get 276076. So far okay? All right. Other miscellaneous deductions, we're not going to get into every single possible scenario. There's a list in the instruction booklet which 
The instructions are downloadable off the IRS.gov web. Every form is available. Every form and all of the instructions for each form are available on IRS.gov under Forms and Publications. So if you're itemizing, if you decide to itemize and you know you have these things, go ahead and check out this list because maybe you have some of those too. You know? Huh? This is their from line 38 on 1040. That's their income. Subtract in the 24 from the oh. zero, zero. Okay, then I add all of this up, all the way down. So we had nothing on the medical. They, you know, that was a zero because they didn't have enough medical. Um, so 6865 plus 3096 plus 1437 plus 9230 plus 276024. Seventy-six. Sorry. Uh, you know, because you, you asked me about it, and I said uh, twenty-four, and then I had twenty-four stuck in my head, and I plugged in twenty-four in the calculator. It's okay, though. I was adding, so it didn't mess up anything else. All right. So this is their itemized deductions. Now, here's the thing: your standard deduction is eleven thousand. There are people. I'm not sure why but that this number is less than that and they choose to itemize anyway, if you choose to do that, you have to check this box. So if this number is less than the standard deduction and you're going to use this form anyway, check that box. I'm not really sure why. I don't know what the motivation there is, but I'm just saying there are people that might do that. So, But we're not doing that. So now we take this number, this is their deductions, and that goes on line 40. On the 1040, yeah. Cause, so that's Schedule A. We're done with Schedule A. It goes in the back. Now, I like to put Schedule A above Schedule B if I'm going to staple these together because it's alphabetical and that makes me happier. I don't think it really matters. Some people might put Schedule B before Schedule A because that's where it came in the form. You know, B, we did B first. I really don't think it matters. But I, I like alphabetical because it makes me feel like the world is in a nice order. Okay, so now we're back to the 1040. We had itemized deduction, so we subtract line 40 from line 38. So we do the 76712 minus 2338876. And now I get my 24 back. Okay. And then we had exemptions. There were three of them. So we're going to multiply it by 3, 3,800 times 3. And we get 11,400. And we subtract that. You get four one nine two three twenty four. This is their taxable income. So they started out with seventy nine thousand eight hundred fifty four, but through deductions they were able to get it down to forty one nine fifty three, and be taxed off of this income. Okay. Now we look for their tax. That is in the tax table, always in the tax table. Oops. And they're married filing jointly, so we'll use that um, second column. And they are 41,923, so they're in this area, so 5,419.
alternative minimum tax is a base is based off of um, income, so we're not going to worry about that right now. Okay. Add lines forty four and forty five. No. You have a foreign tax credit, which I'm not 100% certain of. Okay. Credit for child and dependent care expenses. This is if you have daycare for your or nursing home, things like that. Okay. Now, if we go back to our example, they both pay for child care and they can get a tax credit of $780. So child tax credit, $780. Um, on real taxes, you fill out this form for the child tax credit. So for those of you that have kids, this is the form you'd fill out. It has a front and a back. And the instructions are right on here. Um, for our purposes of our tests and, and our homework assignments, if you're getting a child tax credit, I will say they get a child tax credit of an amount. I'm not going to make you do this particular form. If anybody wants to look over this form with me, I'm happy to show it to you. Okay. Um, then um, education credits. There are, again, there's like the HOPE lifetime credits. You would want to read the instructions and fill out this form 8863 to see if you qualify for those. And the 8863 is a worksheet. Basically, you fill it out and it lets you know if you can qualify or not and then how much to put on here. We're not going to do that one right now. Um, retirement savings contribution credit, we're not going to worry about that right now. But again, there's a form to fill out which tells you if you can get it or not. Uh, child tax, card, sorry, this was the child tax credit. Yeah, child tax credit is this schedule 8812 that you fill out. Um, first, you answer questions about your dependents. Then you answer questions about your income. And then you do some more work on the back if you have three or more kids and that you give your additional child tax credit. So, um, We're, we're not getting that. Residential energy credits. If you switch your appliances to certain energy star appliances, like um, some new air conditioners, basically anything that saves energy, you can get a tax credit. Okay, and the tax credit um, depends on the amount of money that you spent on the appliances. And there's a, hey, there's a form for that. A worksheet to figure it out. Our RO Sullivan's get $133. Okay. Things that qualify are like new energy efficient water heaters, refrigerators, air conditioners and heaters. Um, I don't I don't think dishwashers qualify. Washer and dryer m might qualify. Um, I'm not 100% I'm not 100% certain on that one. I think it's more required items than luxury items. So I'm not 100% I, that's why I know a dishwasher doesn't qualify because I bought one of those and I didn't get it. I'm not 100% certain on the washer and dryer um, because again that it's a luxury versus necessity sort of line and they consider like a hot water heater more of a necessity, you know so, um, like I know ovens don't get it, but refrigerators might, freezers don't, like a big deep freeze, those won't get it, you know, so it's, um, okay, so we've got total credits, so we're adding those two together. Now remember I said that some tax credits get added to the tax you've already paid and some get subtracted from the tax you owe. This section here gets um, 
deducted from the tax you owe. Okay, so we take 5419 and we subtract this 913 from it. And again, they, they say that right here, subtract line 54 from line 46. Okay, so 4506. Now we get to the self-employment tax. If you are self-employed, that means you either own your own business or you're an independent contractor and you didn't pay any tax on like out of a paycheck, you'll get 1099. there's extra tax for that. It actually is at a higher rate than standard income tax. Yes, me too. I think income should be income and $5 if I'm self-employed and $5 if I'm employed should count the same, personally. And you attach a SE for self-employment. Okay. Unreported Social Security and Medicare tax from a form. There's these two forms, and if you um, if you are self-employed, you are supposed you're not you don't have to pay into Social Security. You don't have to pay into Medicare. But if you don't pay into it, you won't get it either. So you should pay into it. And so you fill out the forms. Additional tax on any IRAs or other qualified retirement plans. This is if you're taking the money out. That goes here. Um, household employment taxes from Schedule H. This is if you are... Uh, Either you employ somebody to work in your home or you're employed in somebody's home. I think this is if you're employed in somebody's home. Let's just double check that. But um, Then there's a first-time homeowner buyer credit repayment. Sometimes people get a first-time homeowner buyer credit and then the government comes back and tells them, no, you didn't qualify for that. Now you have to pay it back. That goes there. And then any other taxes that you may owe go here. You add all of these lines up. And you get 4506. Okay. So we're just saying that the, the O'Sullivans did not have any of those. We're saying that there were $9,205.44 withheld from their paychecks. This is if you did that thing where you take your refund from this year and apply it to next year's taxes. That goes here. Earned income credit, if you have a qualifying child, you attach the earned income credit statement. Now, the O'Sullivans have two people and one child, and they made $70,000. They would not qualify for this. This is income-based. Okay, so everybody that qualifies, there's a form. It's always a form. We're not going to do these. The additional tax credit on the back of this form if you have more than three kids is where you get that additional tax credit. Um, we have all these things that you can do. We're just going to say, nope, they didn't do any of that. So they paid 92000 $92,000, $5.44, but they only owe 4506 So we can subtract that. they're going to get a refund and they want it. Now when I went through just now and I calculated how much we were going to say they paid in taxes, I did 13% of their income. If they did not have those deductions that they had and those tax credits that they had, they would have owed money. Okay. Um, 
the average person ends up paying around 20% if they don't have a deduction, like itemized deductions or tax credits. You pay right around, maybe not exactly 20%, but you know, sometimes we're between 15 and 25. So I'm just saying 20% is average. So you want to make sure that around that much is coming out of your check to make sure you're not going to owe money. Any questions on this paper so far? And know that it's kind of... 